author Bruce Sterling is perhaps the best known for his cyberpunk science fiction novels. In this episode of the Plutopia podcast, we discuss cyberpunk and also some of Bruce's other passions, industrial design, steampunk, Frida Kahlo, and space. I follow space stuff. I mean, I'm very interested in astronomy and space exploration. So when I'm looking up stuff from NASA or the ESA or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and you know, and I follow a lot of people who are doing stuff like that, things like um, you know, looking for uh, potential asteroid impacts and the amount of space technology that is present there and the sophistication of it is really impressive. I mean, it, it, there, there aren't a lot of manned human bases where things are, but they're just like unbelievable amounts of drone coverage and just like, I mean, just like fantastic amounts of just incredibly detailed photos of, you know, the surface of Mars, the surface of Venus, you know, like we know what's on the dark side of the moon. We have samples from the dark side of the moon. So welcome everybody to the latest Plutopia podcast. I'm John Lebkoski, and my partner in crime over there is Scoop Sweeney. And our guest today is Bruce Sterling, author, journalist, world traveler, design critic, culture critic, all of those things and more. How you doing, Bruce? I'm about the same. Yeah. Same as what? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm, I'm the same as I am when I'm hanging out in my Ibizan living room here. So, yeah, I'm... I'm on the Spanish island of Ibiza, you know, doing doing the usual kind of mild rubbish, like working on a few small projects, trying to get some fiction done, making lunch for the family, uh, that kind of thing. That sounds great. It's okay. I was going to bring up uh, I was going to bring up something from the past to get us started here, and that is the Viridian Design Movement. <laughs> and I'm bringing that up, especially uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, it was so prescient. <clears throat> well, so what uh, do you what do you think? So wh 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 how do you how do you think now about what you wrote, especially in this last Viridian note? Right. Uh, well, you know, it, it, it obviously it did not succeed in. <laughs> stopping the greenhouse effect from occurring, <laughs> which, which seemed like something that might have been, you know, a physical possibility when that effort was started. It was, it was already pretty late in the game. But, you know, I, I was very interested in kind of the early internet and in like sort of primitive forms of social media. And I knew that climate change was on the way and that it was going to be a heavy crisis. So I thought, well, you know, that's, these are like two things that haven't been combined very much. So why don't I try to use the one and the service of the other? Uh, so, you know, it, 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 what was it like? I mean, if, if, if there's something that the Viridian movement is like, it was like Eastern European dissident kind of rating, right? Because it was never a political party. It, it didn't have like fundraising stuff. It was, um, you know, basically a form of samizdat. No one was writing books about it. Uh, you know, it was not a, a literary effort. It was, um, it was a uh, kind of a discussion group or, or or an open investigation, trying to trying to understand what climate crisis might actually be for a civilization and and what might be done about it to stop it. So, you know, I, I, I was at that for about 10 years and I realized that, you know, that it, it wasn't going to go on. I mean, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't organize my life in that way or, uh, or, or keep things up. But, um, and I eventually I just started teaching industrial design. <laughs> I actually, I actually learned about a lot, a lot about design and a lot about about media and media studies. So it had a big effect on me in terms of like slowing down the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It, it was probably worse than useless. 
Well, it was a design project. Is that sort of what got you into design? Because I, I know that you became very focused on design for many years. I, I was very focused on design, you know, and I, I still know quite a lot of people in that group and, and I, I pay attention to things going on in design. And, uh, I, you know, it, it seemed to me like industrial design was an area where people of my ilk, you know, people who are just sort of writers or critics or theorists might actually intervene. Like, I could have started a, a movement which was just sitting there like scolding people from oil companies, right? Like, a, you know, a, a, fo a fossil fuel scolding group. And there's kind of a lot of those around and, and they're, they're quite old. You know, they're just like groups of activists who go and follow the political interventions of fossil fuel companies and just refute their lies and point out who they are bribing and et cetera, et cetera. So it seemed like that job was being done already, but there weren't, there wasn't a lot of writing about what a uh, post-carbon society might look like or what cities might look like or what, uh, you know, what, what, what work or, or daily habits or industry might look like. And, and designers were some of the few people who would talk about that in a very broad way. When you wrote, uh, wrote uh, Heavy Weather, I looked, yes. I read it, and uh, it, uh, it appeared to me to be far off fiction, and it, <laughs> and it's frightening when you see science fiction becoming uh, today. Uh, how does it feel to have had your work become more like reality? Uh, well, yeah. I, for one thing, I'm very used to it. Like Heavy Weather is actually a rather archaic book. In terms of you know actual what's going on in 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 climate crisis, we don't have a lot of super tornadoes, which are kind of dramatic and easy to write a novel about. Actual crises in the present day are just stuff like lethal heat domes, you know, just sort of show up and kill off the old people, or just massive wildfires because trees have died and they're dried out and you know they they catch fire. So you know here in Spain. If you're looking at the ongoing climate crisis, they're basically worried about forest fires you know, and, and just like really, really big forest fires that just like flatten old forests and just burn stuff down to the ground. And in heavy weather, there's there's sort of no mention of that. I mean, yeah. just, you know, this year not... in, in the United States, there really have been huge tornadoes, uh, hundreds of them that uh, have not we've not seen something like that uh well basically ever uh well yeah except they're not treated i mean people who are studying the tornadoes aren't studying the way the, <laughs> studying them in the way that people in heavy weather study tornadoes <laughs> it's a you know i mean there's there's science fiction people who are running around doing high tech intervention stuff trying to understand weather but they're trying to understand weather in the way that people were trying to understand weather in the late 80s and early 1990s they're not actually doing the kind of you know i don't know ai studies or you know weird meteorological stuff that would be going on now like they don't use um they don't use satellite tracking in heavy weather for instance they do use a lot of drones which is kind of nice but they also use virtual reality which is another thing that sort of never got off the ground sci-fi wise so you know when i when i go through and i page through a work like heavy weather i can usually see tracks of stuff that interested me at the time that you know are, are prescient in some ways but in a lot of other ways they just veer off from reality into a kind of um you know speculative neverland that never happened and i think that's true of science fiction in general and i was like you're going to read science fiction from the 1960s there's going to be a lot of lunar bases and you know exploration of mars and things that seem sexy in the space age maybe a post-atomic war and uh, those are things that were, were very modish to write about at the time, but that turned out they just didn't have much staying power. That kind of brings me to uh, cyberpunk. Uh, of course, you were one of the instigators of the cyberpunk literary subgenre. Um, when you yeah. it, when you look back on things that were written by the various cyberpunk authors, 
I mean, that seems pretty prescient too. Uh, right? Yeah, I mean, that's I'm kind of I'm kind of, you know, I mean, I run across stuff like that all the time. I mean, I'm used to it, then I, I kind of talk about it in a dismissive way. But in terms of science fictional interventions that are like commonplace, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of all over the place. I mean, cyberpunk riffing is, is extremely common and, and more so even than people talking about, say, Ray Bradbury or Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke or, you know, figures from an earlier generation who were considered really extremely um, potent in terms of, you know, science fictional intervention in conventional society, like guys like... Uh, like, you know, Clark and Asimov had like degrees and they're on television all the time and they have movies made of their work and they're certainly much more famous than those cyberpunks were. But in terms of people talking about science fiction and its influence in contemporary culture, people just talk about cyberpunk all the time. I mean, they, they yeah, there were people who... Yeah. Well, there were people back then who, who started saying they were cyberpunks and there was a kind yeah. of cultural proliferation of cyberpunk memes that that yeah. spread throughout rave culture and all over the place it, it did but you know i, I mean and I, I guess i can give us some credit it always disappoints people when i'm all modest about it but the reason it works is that we're in a very cyber society we're not in a very atomic society or a very space age society I mean, there's more of that going on than people understand. Like, there's a whole lot of space stuff. I mean, it's just like an armada of robots on and around Mars. <laughs> you know, I follow space stuff. I mean, I'm very interested in astronomy and space exploration. So when I'm looking up stuff from NASA or the ESA or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and, you know, and I follow a lot of people who are doing stuff like that, things like, um, you know, looking for uh, potential asteroid impacts. And the amount of space technology that is present there and the sophistication of it is really impressive. I mean, it, it, there, there aren't a lot of manned human bases where things are, but they're just like unbelievable amounts of drone coverage and just like, I mean, just like fantastic amounts of just incredibly detailed photos of you know the surface of Mars, the surface of Venus, you know, like we know what's on the dark side of the moon. We have samples from the dark side of the moon, and you know, and not just like a few satellites, but like dozens of hundreds of satellites that are just sitting there doing all kinds of wacky military stuff and communication stuff, and you know, it's there, but it's not valorized, right? It's just. Whereas cyberpunk is something that makes a lot of sense to people because we're in a very cyber society and, you know, and yet we've got a lot of low life. I mean, we, we just have a high tech, low life, high tech, low life style of being. Mm. So well, our, our cyber... kind of mention this, it's like, oh, well, these guys have really good computers, but, you know, basically they're crooks mm. uh, or, or, you know, fascists. Uh, that immediately makes sense to people. It's like, well, yeah, that's that's in fact how I live. <laughs> Our cyber society melted down last week. Uh, how it did. That, how was that? How was the impact in your part of the world? Because a lot of people were figuring it was the end of the world because it, it yeah. was unexpected and unprecedented. Well, it, it wasn't unprecedented. I mean, for somebody to blow out blow out the Microsoft kernel as something that actually has been known to happen in the past. And for, for security upgrades to screw up security is also sort of surprisingly common. But yeah, you know, I, I wrote a lot about computer crime and, you know, and, and, and all of us cyberpunks were very keen on dark sides of computation or just anything that didn't look like it was coming direct from Bell Labs. You know, we, we were just really interested in what computation was going to do to society. So, you know, in my part of the world, which is Italy and Spain, it basically blew out the airports for a couple of days, which cost people a lot of money. And it, it did shut down some hospitals. But, you know, it wasn't like a massive, uh, you know, Y2K style propagating disaster. I mean, it wasn't like a disaster that caused further disasters that caused further disasters, which which was very common in, in Y2K speculation. Just like the thought that 
something would go wrong and then it would cause the else to fail and then like you know a dam would break or uh you know gasoline stations would catch fire or you know self-driving cars would smash into stuff and in point of fact that idea about computers failing just doesn't actually seem to happen so this was you know the the this recent event you know from uh from CrowdStrike, which, by the way, is based in Austin, Texas. <laughs> this is Austin, Texas, bringing Indeed. the world peace. Uh, you know, it hit things and it took out a lot of stuff, but it did not cause some kind of proliferating, massive Y2K style disaster. You know, and I'm not sure those are even possible. The uh, uh, whole thing uh, allowed me to uh, revel in my. Uh, passion for analog technology, which I, I have collected much of it. I'm, I'm surrounded in my studio by vinyl albums and right. tapes and reel to reel. Dead recording. media. <laughs> dead media. Gotta love I, it. Yeah. I love Gotta, dead media I because know. every time there's a, a meltdown, I still have entertainment. I have things I can do and it does not rely upon the internet. But of course, I'm totally in embedded in the internet and digital technology as well it's just it's nice to have a hobby that's totally you know off the uh, beaten track of technology as we know it yeah I, I agree with you i think that's actually very healthy for people and uh you know i i was discussing this with a lot of my fellow cyberpunks now and the, they all have creative hobbies of of one kind or another. You know, it's like some of them make music and some of them paint on weekends. Or some of them take photography. <laughs> and we were all sort of rejoicing in the fact that we're really bad at it, which I think is kind of great. You, know, you, need, you need a hobby where it's not your intention to be a professional. You know, it's like something that actually, you know, just kind of livens you up and where you're where you're continuing to learn and where you're kind of making the sophomore mistakes, uh, that does you better than like a side hustle where you're like trying to like make a lot of money, you know? So, you know, my interest in design is like that. I, I've been known to design things and I kind of make artworks even, but I never sell artworks. And I, I've had like one thing that I made go into production. So, you know, in terms of industrial design, I'm an industrial design critic. I did a little bit just to show that I could, but I I have never been like bitterly upset that I'm not a professional industrial designer. Yeah. How did, how did you become an actual design critic? I mean, I know you've taught design and, and you've done a lot of design criticism. Yeah. Sort of how did you get into that at a professional level? Well, you know, there aren't really a lot of people doing it. I mean, it seems like an arcane thing to do, but when you actually read like works about design, they're usually written by either retired designers who become design teachers, or they're written by people who are basically consumers, right? Uh, and they just want to find out what's a really nice design thing to have, right? They're not really interested in the theory of how things are designed. On the contrary, they just like want to know what's like the best kind of couch or the most attractive kind of tableware. And design magazines are usually about that. I mean, they're basically for consumers, right? And if you go, I mean, I've taught at some design schools and, and, and you know, I like in the Gulf states, they have like big design schools. And I went there once because I knew some guys on the faculty. And it was clear that like literally, I mean, there was a big school and there were a lot of people in it, but clearly they were just being educated on what to buy, right? I mean, none of them, I mean, they're all wealthy kids, you know, they're like petrocrats from the Emirates or whatever. Uh, but, you know, they were basically getting a kind of finishing school education in what to spend your money on. Like, how do you, how do you outfit, how do you properly outfit your penthouse and, you know, in a mile high skyscraper. And, you know, maybe one out of a hundred of these guys actually wanted to design something. Mostly they just sort of wanted to know what was cool, right? So when I write about design, it's very rare for me to recommend that people buy anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that kind of design writer. I'm actually a guy who writes about design theory and kind of design history. And there just aren't many people who, who who do that. And if you're like, if you're actually knowledgeable about it, people who are in that area are actually kind of grateful. 
right? Like I've never had anybody in the design world say, why is a science fiction writer writing about design? On the contrary, I still got, well, you know, I, I've got a piece coming out in the next issue of Domus, which was commissioned by, you know, the, the current editor of Domus, who's like Lord no Norman Foster. He's like famous Pritzker winning architect and sometimes magazine editor. He's like, let's get Bruce Sterling to write about this art archive that's been placed on the moon. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and you know, it's not like I got up in the morning and said, you know what? I need to write about art archives on the moon. On the contrary, I get some email from somebody who like needs some weird guy to write a weird article about art archives on the moon. And, and then I proceeded to do it. And you know, at the moment, I know a hell of a lot about art archives on the moon. It's like, why is there an art archive on the moon? There's several <laughs> art archives on the moon, and there's going to be a lot more art archives on the moon. It's really kind of is weird. That is that for the sake of the people who eventually are going to be settling the moon so that they'll have art available? Or is it more no, for like aliens all, who are the, allowed you know, to go to the moon like first? There's like little gangs of guys. They, they all kind of know one another. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a long now archive on the moon. I don't know. There's like the things there. That they're makes thinking. sense. Well, yeah, you know, it's like, let's put it in orbit. Let's just put something somewhere where people aren't going to look at it. And plus, you know, you can put like an amazing amount of stuff on just like a few sort of inscribed discs or um, or, or or maybe, you know, some kind of digital hardware thing. You know, and even like many, many years ago, like Voyager, right, had an art archive on it, right? So it, it, it's a, for generations, people have been like bolting art onto spacecraft and just launching it hither and yon. It's, it's not like a, an unheard of thing. It's just not a big deal in the art world, and it's not a big deal in the space world. So it kind of falls into this science fictional hole where it sounds like a cool idea, but actually nobody's paying attention. And sure. I, I, also had, I also had that feeling in writing about design that a lot of the times the people who were doing really good and interesting work, were, they're not being culturally appreciated. They're not really taken seriously as public intellectuals. And, well, and, I, and I was willing to do that. I mean, I'm sort of willing to like listen to what they have to say and kind of valorize it. Is Elon Musk going to be uh, archived anywhere? He has filled our well, skies. You know, he, he, like, he put a bunch of stuff inside the like, glove compartment of a Tesla and shot it into outer space. Oh, so, yeah. You know, and, and plus, he's like recorded music and he's like done all this stuff. And like his mistress is this pop star and. Yeah, I mean, Elon, you know, I'm, plus he owns like all this publishing stuff, you know, I mean, Twitter and all these other kinds of things. So and 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 plus, he's just very keen on valorizing himself and his own efforts. So, yeah, of course, he's going to do it. Yeah, he has he's uh, put a car in outer space. It's still up there. Yeah, he's filled our skies with satellites. And I'm wondering <laughs> how many more car, he can put, put up. A car into orbit, you know, it's like the only car that's in outer space. The only car. It's you know, there's like billions of cars. Nobody ever launched one. It didn't make any sense, but you know, Elon enjoys that. I wonder where that car is right now. You know, is I it could still look it orbiting? Up. Yeah, no, I, I think it's actually went into like uh, an, an extra terrestrial orbit. I think it's like somewhere between Earth and Mars, and a loop. Wow. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I, I didn't the, look the, it up. <laughs> You know, it's impossible to keep up with all of Elon's space debris. He's really, I mean, pieces of it are landing in Canada. He's dropping a lot of, dropping a lot of garbage. Even his space launches launch a bunch of debris. And I mean, he didn't bother to build like water pits. So whenever one of these giant things takes off, rocks just take off and fly like meteors all over South Texas. Yeah, he's <laughs> pissed off all the UFO groups because uh, they keep spotting falling or rising uh, space you know, he, junk he, and they say, well, is it a UFO? No, it's just Elon. And I, I would say that, you know, other other moguls are becoming more like Elon Musk faster than Elon Musk is is becoming like a normal person. He's like, he's like dragging other guys in his orbit rather than calming down and deciding to become more, more statesman-like. He's a, he's got a you know reality distortion feel and it's sucking people into it. 
Yeah, very similar to Trump, I think. I think that's one of the reasons that he admires Trump so much because these guys he's using managed a lot of to. Trump, he's using a lot of Trump's basic methods. You know, I mean, they, they actually work in a socially mediated landscape. It's just like stay in the news. You know, you don't even want to be in television or, or you know, a conventional media. There's kind of none of that left. You want like, you want exciting, at least one exciting panic every week. And it, it kind of doesn't matter whether they like you or dislike you. You don't really need, you just need to be there. You know, you just, you need to kind of suck the oxygen out of the room. And, you know, he's made a lot of money. He's also lost a lot of money, but he just makes it back. I mean, the government gives it to him and you know, all, whatever. He's he's doing, he sold a lot of cars. They don't work all that well. It doesn't matter that much. He did a pretty good job of uh, leveraging social media and, of course, actually buying Twitter and turning it into this weird thing called yeah. X. Yeah. Uh, but part of that sort of, I guess, nudged forward an evolution that we were already kind of seeing about people yeah. wanting to get away from the the traditional like social media framework of, of Facebook and Twitter and moving well, on you know, to he, other he's platforms. Great at making people, he's great at making people talk about him, which is something we're doing right now. But, you know, once you know what he's up to, he's actually more boring than you would think. You know? I believe I mean, it. it. It's annoying that he lies all the time. You know? I mean, I, I don't think he's like, I don't think he's actually writing sci-fi in his head. I do think he takes ketamine, but you know, I, I don't think he's actually a visionary. I think the guy's basically a charlatan and, you know, and it's annoying to put up with this kind of, you know, ranting bullshit all the time. It's like, why doesn't he settle down and like actually do something useful? Uh, it just gets, you know, he, he had a lot of charm that he kind of frittered away. And, and I, I think that's the kind of, that's the downside of the Trumpian gambit, you know, when you're when you're making yourself rich and famous through your notoriety, people eventually just get disgusted with you. He's become kind of a space age carpetbagger coming to Texas. He's moving everything to Texas simply because the regulations are pretty much non-existent in Texas, thanks to the Republican uh, power structure here in the state. Yeah. And he's, you know, really pissed off the people around the SpaceX uh, complex in uh, South Texas because he's basically taken over everything. And uh, if it blows, if he blows up a spaceship, it's no big deal because he owns most of the uh, real estate now. Well, it's, it's, it's nice that he's able to command that, that much public attention. I, don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think the guy's going to end well. I kind of worry about him. I mean, he's an interesting figure in a lot of ways, but not in the way that he himself wants to be interesting. And that's kind of kind of sad. <laughs> it's, uh, it's I don't know. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, following current events is something I used to do with like tremendous glee and interest. And now I'm I'm more. What, what should I say? I'm, I'm more of a septuagenarian. I still spend a lot of time researching, but I tend to research historical stuff rather than things in the present day. And uh, also, I don't write that much cyberpunk. A lot of the writing that I do now is basically a historical fantasy. But personally, I, I always wrote a lot of historical fantasy. From the, the earliest years of my career, I was writing you know, alternate history and, and steampunk. And uh, you know, steampunk, is not as famous as cyberpunk, but it's also sort of weirdly omnipresent. Like today, I was in a Chinese grocery, not a grocery, but a, a hardware store, kind of a general store here in Ibiza. And they're selling like framed artwork from China to Ibizans. And one of them is a steampunk picture of Frida Kahlo wearing an eye patch, a top hat and goggles. Okay, this is Frida Kahlo, manufactured in China and sold by Chinese entrepreneurs to Ibizan tourists, right? Okay, Frida Kahlo is kind of a famous artist, you know, for a Mexican Jewish woman. She's remarkably well known, but a steampunk Frida Kahlo that's Chinese in Ibiza. I mean, I took a picture of it. 
you know, I mean, I didn't buy the picture. I don't actually need, I don't need a framed steampunk photo of Frida Kahlo. But the fact that there was a framed steampunk Frida Kahlo picture while I was like trying to buy a lawn chair is like one of those things that I actually find weird. I mean, like you're you're living in a Bruce Sterling world in that way. Um, and I, I don't mind that because, you know, I, I do tend to speculate in trends that have some legs. But this is more like an actual Bruce Sterling fictional emanation thing, you know, because William Gibson and I wrote this book, Difference Engine, which is, you know, a very early steampunk book. And it's it's a historical fantasy. And, you know, steampunk got it got a big kick in the pants at the same time cyberpunk did. It was kind of the historical fantasy little sister of cyberpunk. And in some ways, it's got more it's got more staying power. I mean, you wouldn't see a cyberpunk Frida Kahlo from China, right? I mean, you know, imagine imagine the, the somebody sitting there with a marketing pole and you're like in China and you're deciding like what to print and ship to Spain. And somebody says, well, you know, we need some steampunk Frida Kahlo. And you say, yeah. I mean, how is that decision even possible? <laughs> I mean, the it fact seems, that it's Chinese, it seems a little strange. Yeah, I mean, it's more than a little strange because it's not like a Mexican person turning Frida Kahlo into a steampunk. I don't think Mexicans would want to turn Frida Kahlo into a steampunk. I mean, for them, she's like a significant cultural figure. It's the Chinese who would want to turn Frida Kahlo into a steampunk for the sake of Europeans. You know, that's, I that's suppose really there are steampunk elements in uh, in Diego Rivera's work. Uh, whatever, I, whatever I, that I, might I, imply. I don't know. If you think Trotsky was steampunk, then yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, Trotsky probably was steampunk. <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing that's interesting is that when, when, when they, when Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo were still alive, he was extremely famous, and she was considered like his weird Jewish girlfriend. And now that they're both dead, she's world famous. I mean, she's on socks, she's on t-shirts, she's on surfboards. And you have to explain who Diego Rivera was. Like, oh yes, he was a Marxist Mexican muralist who did a lot of work inside buildings. Okay, it's just, yeah, he's kind of not there. He's, he's fallen into abeyance in, in peculiar ways. Well, she's a she's a very striking figure, you know. Uh, Diego Rivera wasn't quite as striking just as a person. You no, know, but Diego, but those Diego images Rivera of her day was considered a major artist. He was like, you know, a kind of um, kind of a uh, king of Mexican socialism, and you know, kind of had the Communist Party's wind at his back in the 1930s. Uh, you know, if you were of the international left and you, you were concerned about like the Spanish Civil War or the legacy of the Mexican Revolution, Diego Rivera was considered like a great artist, like really a man of the people and so forth. And it's just very difficult for an artist to even have that kind of reputation in a conventional society. They just kind of know they're there. It's like a, it's like, um, you know, it's like being a, a folk singer, a left wing folk singer with a guitar. Oh, it's, you just can't. It's, it's a social role that isn't there. Whereas being a like a weird Jewish bisexual painter surrealist somehow fits. It's like there's a lot of women who want to be Frida Kahlo. I mean, I went to Frida Kahlo's house. There were, you know, in Mexico City, the wife and I were there. I was like, oh, we got to go to Frida Kahlo's house because she's Frida Kahlo. And you know, the the place was crammed, and there was scarcely a man in it. I mean, yeah, it's like maybe it. two other husbands and like swarms of women from all over the world. When I lived in Berkeley, you could go up on Telegraph Avenue to the revolutionary bookstores and shops, and you'd see Frida and Shay side by side. So that yeah. that was the the big revolutionary thing in the seventies and eighties. Well, that was a big revolutionary thing in the twenties and thirties. I mean, she was Trotsky's mistress. I mean, Frida Kahlo would have sex with anything in pants or a skirt. So it's not really amazing that she would go have sex with Trotsky while Trotsky was in exile in, in Mexico City. But, you know, she was she was literally the mistress of the Trotskyite wing of the Communist International. And she, she's not like somebody who just thinks that Che Guevara looks cool in 1970. On the contrary, she's, 
you know, very much of the revolutionary left and the anti-fascist armed left. I was trying to think of an artist who is, uh, I don't know, iconic currently, you know, in, in 21st century uh, culture. And the one I could think of was Banksy. Yeah, Banksy. You know, you know, Banksy, um, I mean, he's not Frida Kahlo, but he's somebody who's, whose reputation worldwide, you know, kind of, uh, kind of rings with that. You know, and also he's he's a guy of the kind of underground left. You know, he's got this kind of Robin Hood lefty thing going on, which is a very difficult thing to do when you don't actually have organized left wing parties. <laughs> so it's just it's just kind of hard to it's hard to do that. You know, it's almost like writing great poetry in the Latin language. It's like okay, you can learn how to do it. It's just it's never going to get any traction in contemporary society. It just not something people can actually say. So it's it's a funny thing. I mean, you know, uh, as as somebody who's a cyberpunk writer, um, it's a little alarming and kind of painful that you don't have an actual literary legacy in the way that people did when science fiction was more of a paper based situation. Like I spend a lot of time in social media, just sort of distributing memes and making funny comments on message services. And I wonder why I do that, but you know, people all over the world are looking at it, and you know, it, it's not something that wins you lasting literary appeal, but it's just something that's kind of cheap and easy to do, and it's also something you can do from a place like Ibiza. <laughs> I happen to live in Ibiza for family reasons, but it's a lot like Robert Louis Stevenson living in Samoa. You're just not next to the centers of publishing, so if you're going to do anything, it's going to be like letters or you know weird little interventions you're, you're not going to go to the i'm not at world con and <laughs> it's the world science fiction convention which is going on right now you know i don't do that but i i still have like this public presence they're doing all this electronic stuff i don't even know who's writing science fiction anymore i mean i read a few and you know uh actually um Annalee Newitz. Yeah. I'm very fond of Annalee Newitz, you know, and yeah, that whole Annalee crowd. Newitz is so a good science fiction writer. There are people who are, you know, they're they're quite good at doing it and they're like can write entertaining stuff, but the kind of structure for doing it isn't there. You know, it's like going on a book tour or getting your book reviewed in, you know, the Akron Daily Herald. Okay, these things don't really exist. I mean, even Austin, which had something of a literary scene. It's not really a town that would have a literary scene under contemporary conditions. It would have a gamer scene or, a, you know, a programming scene or a, maybe a social media scene or whatever they're doing at South by Southwest, but not really like, you know, a regional writing scene or especially not a regional writing science fiction scene. That's actually kind of difficult to do in an Anglophone society now. There's, there's, there's no local there street. There's not like local bookstores. There does seem to be a ton of people who are writing science fiction, though, and I've noticed that a lot of them are women. There's a lot more women yeah, writing lots. science fiction now. Yeah, there's tons of tons of uh, science fiction. You know, it's not. I mean, I follow it because I'm in the business, and you know, I, I follow a lot of people on these on social media, like reviewing their work or are kind of actively boosting various you know factions within the field. But yeah, there are a lot of women, and there's also like a lot of women who are not from the United States, who have a very high profile in science fiction, and that used to be kind of impossible. I think you know, all forms of paper, print on paper publishing have been feminized to a, a kind of, to a surprising extent, and the, and the same goes for like broadcast television. It's just like the demographics for broadcast television are just very female-centric. But there are other areas that are really, really female centric, like the romance writers of America, and they recently went bankrupt. I mean, the romance writers of America, unlike science fiction writers who can at least have an event, uh, they couldn't have any events. I mean, they 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 lost all their money. They had a, a, a massive decline in viewership, and they had signed up to have national conventions, and they couldn't pay for their hotel. 
So everybody just began finger pointing and now they've just all run off in different directions, which is super interesting. <laughs> I bet a lot of the that, that's amazing to me. I mean, romance traditionally outsells science fiction by an order of magnitude. Yeah, a lot of right. the studly guys they would have on the covers were probably put out of work as well. That was always my mom was really into uh you know romance novels, and it was always some really striking looking guy and a young woman in you know, passionate uh, embrace. And well, you know, it, it it is a genre, you know, it's a genre like cowboy writing or mysteries or, you know, other other kinds of genres. And, you know, and science fiction is a genre and it's just kind of difficult to have a genre in a society where you don't have paper-based media and paper-based distribution that are dominant. But although there's a lot of women in science fiction, there's a lot of women in romance too, and that didn't seem to help them. I mean, all the readers are women and all the writers are women, but they they just can't seem to they can't seem to to get a going thing together. Now there's a lot of self-published romance, you know, just tons of fanfic uh, that 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 romance writers want to read, but there's kind of no industry for that. It's basically romance social media. There does still seem to be a a, a market, a significant market for fiction, science fiction. I don't know about romance. Well, you know, um, people, people read a lot, but there's not like this kind of hierarchy of readership where you've got like Nobel Prize winners at the top and like blue collar kind of, you know, people at the bottom. I mean, the, the kind of relatively stable structure of 20th century publishing, which was never all that stable, but it was sort of stable, is just, it doesn't really work. I mean, there's just, I mean, in Spain, it's interesting because there's a lot of young writers. And in Spain, they tend to write crime novels. So you can be a young crime novel writer in Spain and you can make a living, right? But they don't have anybody who's like in the position of Stephen King. There's no sort of like massive Spanish super best-selling writer. And there's a few, but they're not they're not that big and they're not and they're not old. I mean, the people who are who are sort of well-established are not people who made their reputations in the 60s and 70s and are kind of gliding along, you know, like a, like a lot of, you know, elderly writers in the United States. So in some ways, the Spanish publishing scene is considerably healthier and I think more creative than the American publishing scene. You know, a new Michael Crichton book Spanish was just published and... There's a little bit of ciencia ficción. You know, oddly, I, I don't hang out with them very much. I do. I know people in 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 um, in uh, Fantascienza, Italian science fiction. I have a lot of friends. Well, I was saying that a new Michael Crichton book was just published, and look how long he's been dead, and his stuff is still like rolling out. In this case, James. Oh wait a minute! I muted myself, didn't I? Um, okay, yeah. James Patterson. Second, can, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, Michael Crichton had had written this book about a volcano, you know, eruption, and uh, yeah. and somebody found it and gave it to James Patterson, and he finished it. Uh, there's still like authors who had a certain like buzz around their names and uh, who actually had a yeah. reputation. They can still publish even when they're dead, apparently. Yeah, well, there there are writers who have buzz like. Otessa Moshfeg. <laughs> Otessa Moshfeg is like a rare American writer who's big in Spain. Like Spanish writers are really digging Otessa Moshfeg. And she's pretty well known in the United States, too. Like my wife likes reading Otessa Moshfeg. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like there are no writers or sort of no famous writers, but, you know, it, it's, it's more like the pop music scene where there's just not a Rolling Stones or Beatles. And there's just not any way for you to build such a thing, right? It just, I mean, you could, if you went on tour, it wouldn't work. You know, if you were, if you were on Spotify, it, you just wouldn't gain that kind of uh, social eclat, you know, people just won't pay attention to it. It's just kind of gone. Well, in this age of uh, uh, AI deep fakes, I'm waiting for uh, the deep fake novelist to, uh, 
arise because the, you know, there, that there's a lot like of a logical there, there, progression. There just aren't any hits. I mean, you know, on on uh, on Amazon, people are publishing three deep fakes a day. You know, with deep fake covers and deep fake text, and there's just a lot. You know, and sometimes people sell them. Mostly they they engage in kind of fake promotion on Amazon, trying to entrap human beings into buying these books. So they have all these uh, sock puppet accounts that say, oh, it's great. And then, you know, they make a little money if some human being accidentally buys it. But I think what will be really interesting is a work by an AI, which is actually a popular hit. You know, or, or, or maybe a scientific text by an AI, which actually says something that would make scientists sit up in their chairs. And, you know, since AI is trained on scientific texts more than it's trained on popular novels, it wouldn't surprise me too much if it actually wrote some kind of white paper that, like, people were really amazed by. So, and I, and I don't know, I don't know what comes after that. You know, it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a very, it's very interesting to have literary players that don't, that that are not of human origin, and and I've been reading. I'm trying to computer generated text for many many years for decades. You know, I I used to read books like The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed. <laughs> just like, okay, how does this work? So you know, I've seen it done, and yeah, the generators they're just not at all like these earlier forms of computerized writing. They're really doing something. Well, like I said in a recent Medium article, it's like as different from human writing as bamboo is from styrofoam. I'm trying to imagine the prompt that would be required to generate a novel. It seems like it's it would be a fairly... Hard. I mean, you, you can do it. I mean, you can like do it a single line, just write me a 60,000 word novel. I mean, generators don't get bored. And if you told them to write a novel that was six billion pages long, they could do that quite easily. I mean, they'd use up a lot of voltage and somebody would pull your plug. But in terms of just putting words in a row, there's they're never gonna get tired. I mean, they're they're stochastic parrot devices, they're just gonna roll it right along, you know. So that's it. they don't they don't have the limitations that humans have, you know. Um you just wrote you just wrote something about. AI having a dialect. I a, did, a yeah. I did dialect. Read this piece the dialect of Delvish, which is what it actually like to read AIs. And you know, and I do read a lot of AI text. I mean, I deliberately read a lot of AI text. And you know, I'm I'm always looking at somebody who can like use AI to 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 create a text that's really worthwhile. And I'm I'm also very interested in you know AI artwork. I mean, last year we at Share Festival, which is the festival in Turin where I'm the art director, we had a show which was all about contemporary AI art. You know, and it's like the stuff that's interesting is not the stuff that it does like a human. It's the it's when it does stuff that no human would ever imagine doing, right? So it doesn't seem and and no, nobody seems to be tuning it to do that, right? I mean, they don't. When when guys who own AIs do do AIs, they basically want it to do Norman Rockwell. They don't actually want AIs to push the limits of like what motion graphics can do, right? And okay. also when they right. when they try to get AIs to talk, they want AIs to be um, helpful and harmless and polite. But they never actually try to get AIs to write about what the world would look like if you were an AI. Yeah, a right. lot of the criticism of Chat GPT and uh, uh, similar things uh, is that it uh, tends to hallucinate. And I've read, yeah. I've read plenty of human writers who obviously were hallucinating when they wrote. So, there's not well, you know, that, that's an interesting topic. And, you know, it's kind of controversial because people who program them don't want you to use the term hallucinate. And I'm not super happy with the term hallucinate either, because I don't think they have a mind that is capable of hallucination. What they've got is a kind of um, a, a generative fabulation process where when they don't know the immediate answer, they kind of stick together pieces of stuff that looks like it's statistically likely to work. But, you know, it, it's interesting. What they say is actually 
interesting. I mean, they say things that no human would say, and they're not they're not connected to reality because AIs don't actually have perception. I mean, they don't have eyes, ears, a body. They don't have a brain, but they do have like a trillion dimensional analysis of kind of everything ever written and most things that were ever recorded or put on paper. And there's just, there's a lot of holes in that kind of giant common crawl text where stuff might be going on that human beings have just never thought about, right? And 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 it's not necessarily a fantasy, right? I mean, there might be aspects of reality that people have just not seen, like, you know, a blind spot or things that the human mind, I mean, logical fallacies that the human mind has that a mindless stochastic parrot thing might potentially kind of unearth. And and that's what I would find extremely interesting. I mean, as as an art critic, that would be the AI art that I that I would be really interested in. I mean, I've got zero interest in AI art doing science fiction covers. And I like, I mean, it can do them and it can do them really quickly. And I've seen literally hundreds of thousands of them. <laughs> I mean, until you until you've been until you've been an art director, you don't understand how much bad art there is. <laughs> so I've seen I've seen amazing amounts of bad AI art. <laughs> well, one might uh, mistake uh, the uh, AI hallucinations to, for perhaps uh, it was actually the uh, writings of uh, some alien being who just fell to earth and has no idea what we do and how we speak and how we write. Well, you know, I, I, I would, um, I would not be like terribly shocked if some AI, kind of by accident, had like a kind of Copernican breakthrough thing where instead of like, you know, planets have been going around the sun. I mean, suns have been going around the Earth for a long time, but this kind of math is kind of difficult. So, what if we just presume that the sun is at the center of the solar system, I and mean, then and that the the planets actually move in ovals instead of everything being like spheres of heaven. I mean, the math would work better. And I think an AI might be able to not discover a thing like that, but it might just be that it would work better for an AI and that people would never have seen it, right? I mean, it would be something that an AI would hallucinate or or, or, or confabulate, but it would be better connected to reality than human ideas are connected to reality like human ideas and in a, in, in a human reality the sun doesn't go the earth doesn't go around the sun i mean if you go outside the sun comes up over the earth and it goes like this and then it goes down over the horizon and we still talk that way i mean the sun rises the sun sets right now the earth is twisting right it's like but nobody would say that it's like oh the horizon rising okay you know, for, to a human sensorium, that's just what life is for us. But that's not the mathematical reality of what's going on with the Earth, right? And maybe an AI would be able to discover a thing like that. I mean, not that he thinks it through like Copernicus, more that he just kind of blunders into it. Like I'm trying to do it in the most efficient way, and the best, of, the most efficient way is to sort of pay no attention to humans. You know, in the way that like. Um, Alpha Zero plays Go, right? It just self plays with itself. It pays no attention to the human traditions of Go, and then it can just soundly defeat any human. Accidentally real. Well, yeah, yeah. you know, only accidental. I mean, it's sort of a debate. I mean, it's a debate between the difference between artificial intelligence or large language models and human intelligence. And I don't think the human intelligence has existence figured out. And I was like, it would be very awkward of us to claim such a thing. But now we have these machines that can like make these statistical analyses of things going on. And maybe there's a statistical analysis that's just very different and seems alien. And we might dismiss it as a hallucination and then find out that it's objectively true. It just like works in the lab, you know, you can go out and test it. I don't think human intelligence has human intelligence figured out. You know, I don't think humans have artificial general intelligence. I don't know. I mean, humans. Yeah. 
they don't. I mean, humans have to like grow up. I mean, if you've got like a four-year-old in the house, which I do, I mean, she's human and she's <laughs> intelligent, but you know, she's not an AI. She's just a little kid, you know. And you know, you, you can see her learning, and you know, it's not like she's mentally ill in any way. She's just a small child, you know, she's not gonna pass. I mean, she's illiterate, you know, she can't read and write, and you know. So, you know, if that's what human intelligence is, and you know, she's human and she's intelligent, okay, that's a very limited kind of intelligence, obviously. Uh, and 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 I don't need, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, you know, people sleep, you know, they have dreams, people hallucinate, they they have all kinds of, you know, unusual uh unusual driving forces. You know, you don't you don't you don't get out of bed in the morning because somebody argues you into it, you know, you have like this kind of vital force or you know whatever i mean i don't want to talk like a vitalist but i'm okay with the ideas that humans aren't intelligent all the time you know and that our definitions of intelligence are flawed and that large language models are actually like a new thing in the world that probably don't have that much to do with our ideas of intelligence so like talking about their intelligence or their will or their perception or their hallucination actually gets in the way of what they're good at doing yeah, yeah I've, got a, a, I've got a human intelligence proteins. I've added human intelligence to my list of oxymorons anyway. So the, the people I see uh, in yeah. the news, uh, it's it, there's uh, I'm I'm not sure what they're doing. It's not well, that no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's dismissive. You know, I, on the contrary, I'm I'm like inclined to valorize some forms of animal intelligence. Like you know, ants or crows or dolphins. I mean, they they probably deserve more credit than they're getting. Octopi, you know. If we were if we were sort of kinder about what we th think intelligence is, I think we'd be kind of more at peace with ourselves and probably happier. But I, I spent a lot of time with LLMs, and I'm a little frustrated that people want to make them so human. Uh, it's it's like watching people build robots and then always trying to make them into stage actors. They yeah, I mean, to... it's always seemed weird to me that that people want to assume that machines can have some form of consciousness or something like human intelligence or human awareness. And you know, machines yeah. are machines; they're different. They're not the same. Well, I, I wrote this story about three years ago, where it's all about an art critic wandering around in twenty second century Italy following an artificially intelligent robot that makes art. It's called Robot and Roses. And he spends all this time trying to convince his sidekick that the robot is neither artificially intelligent nor a machine, that it belongs to a mysterious third order of being, which is, you know, just kind of there, like, like quantum physics or something. It's just, it's not human, it's not mechanical, but it's it's like there and artistically expressive. And, you know, I, I, that was a fun story to write. I, I really worked through a lot of my issues there. I didn't convince anybody, but it's actually about, I mean, it's a science fiction story about things that actually bother me and, and contemporary, contemporary society. And it got a good reaction. I mean, people who read that story are, are kind of impressed by it. I mean, they, they really think, okay, you know, this is science fiction doing what science fiction can do, but not in a normal science fictional way. You know, we're, we're close to the end of the hour, and I, I did want to bring up the fact that you and I, every year, have this conversation about the state of the world, and that has become so increasingly surreal lately. <laughs> So what do you uh, think well, of the you know, state I, of the world today? Yeah, well, you know, the state, state of the world is obviously pretty bad, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting to read history and realize how bad the state of the world has been at other periods. So, you know, recently I've been reading a lot of Primo Levi. I actually wrote, the, or actually read the complete works of Primo Levi, which are translated into, into English. I was reading him in Italian. He's a very good Italian writer, by the way. His Italian is super good. He's like, you know, his prose style is really sort of crisp and elegant. And I was like, Italians who read Italian think he's a really good Italian writer. But he's also a guy who went to the concentration camps. 
There's like an Italian Jew who's just like basically kidnapped by the Germans and sent to Auschwitz where he had to live for a year, you know, and yeah, we're doing state of the world on the well, but we have never been in any within several orders of magnitude how bad and how surreal Auschwitz was. Right. And even when he gets out of Auschwitz, and then he's got like another year and a half where he's trying to get back to Turin in Italy and just things are just in a state of complete collapse. I mean, Germany's dead. Hitler shot himself. You know, waves of armies are going back and forth. Everything's being looted. You know, you, you know really, people don't know where their next meal is coming from, very literally. And they're starving to death and they're freezing to death because there's no electrical power. There's no clothing. He doesn't have shoes. Like he gets out of the camp. He's picked up by a sidekick who's like this gypsy. Gypsy tells him, how come you've got no shoes? He says, well, you know, I, 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 don't, I haven't even eaten. I'm like I'm starving to death. And he tells him, look, you're obviously a fool because if you have shoes, you can get food. But if you have food, you can't get shoes. Okay. In the well state of the world, we've never not had shoes. Okay. We've always... We've always had some shoes. <laughs> and uh, it's true. You know, and I, I've some, been in places. Well, pampered, I've been in places I think. Things, I've been in places that among groups of people where things are quite tough, like, you know, prisons or, um, uh, you know, or I've lived in the Balkans. And I've, I've lived in India for quite a while. I used to go into slums in India. Okay. Slums in India are places where people are really, really poor. They're like abjectly poor. But, they're not as bad as human society can get and also have people survive. And not only did Primo Levi survive, he was like one of 50 survivors from the group of 600 people in his, in his train. He actually went back and became like an internationally famous writer and, and kind of a public celebrity, right? And, and wrote some pretty good stuff. I mean, his reputation as a writer has never been higher in Italy right now. I mean, he's, there are people, there are schools named after him. I mean, like he could get statuary, right? So, you know, people have more, um, I mean, you die and everybody dies. There's like a high level of mortality, but people's ability to adjust to the weird is very underestimated. Like, you know, let That's me, for sure. Le Levy arrives, he's in really bad shape. He's basically got post-traumatic stress disorder. He, he's sick. And like, he just meets this girl on the street in Turin, like on a bus. And then like six hours, he knows he's going to marry her. And his life just completely turns around. He's like, oh, well, I got to get a job now because I have to get married. And I was, this is the one, you know, it's going to be her. And she's like this, another Jewish survivor. So, you know. What are they going to do? Well, you know, we're going to get married and have children. That's absolutely. I don't know. If you so get like, it's like a job in a paint factory, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? Well, you know, I used to be in Auschwitz and I've got like this tattoo on my arm, but um, mostly I make paint. If you, know, you listen to Americans, paint, uh, if you listen to Americans talking about their, uh, about inflation and they're yeah. just, uh, they, you know, they make it uh, sound like they're in, you know, in Auschwitz because they had to pay $10 for Captain Crunch cereal or something. Yeah. No, well, people have no idea. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, uh, American people, Americans have kind of a pampered lifestyle in some ways, but there's also a lot of just absolute vital misery in America that you don't recognize unless you've lived somewhere else. Like, right. Appalachia. I mean, American history is quite grim. There's a lot of ethnic cleansing and, you know, pandemics and, and very serious wars and a very serious land war. But there's also just like a whole lot of really grim poverty in the USA. Just like no social net, kind of no support. And it's 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 very, it, it can be a rather tough area. I mean, there are areas of, areas of the USA which are, you know, make the third world look good. I know, and it's kind of hidden. I used to work in poverty programs, and I was shocked at what I found and what I learned, you know, over that couple of decades that I was doing I that kind go, of work. Hang out on the reservation or in the ghetto or the barrio. Yeah. You know? I mean, there, there are people there who are kind of, you know, at astonishing levels of material, material deprivation and just kind of no way out. You know, it's like, 
and suicide rates are quite high in the USA and drug abuse rates are very high. And also they tend to shoot one another with astonishing glee by the standards of the rest of the world. So it's not like life isn't tough in, in the US. I don't know, it actually is, it's just tough in a different way. Yeah, it's a rough time here. But we, no, we've I, actually I reached the end of the hour. Hanging out next to my library in Ibiza, I'm kind of counting my blessings here. Yeah, it's yeah, a me little too. tedious, but I, I have to say, I've rarely had life so easy. As you always say, every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. Pleasant thing. Well, thank you, Bruce. Thanks so right. much for joining us. This was great. Let's do it again sometime. That would be pleasant. Hope to drop by Austin. That would be good. Come Thanks. on. Back. Okay, Thanks we'll be looking help. for you. Appreciate it. See okay. You. We will see you soon. Adios. Adios. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.